Love this guy um, and thrilled to see what is going on with his career at the Worldwide Leader in Sports. He is the newest member of their Monday Night Football NFL Countdown Gang. So you can watch him prior to every Monday Night Football game, halftime and post-game show with Joe Buck and Aikman in the booth and the Manning brothers when they're doing their thing on ESPN2. Monday night is a festival and the worldwide leader in sports. And joining us on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line is ESPN analyst and the 27, uh, 2011 Heisman Trophy winner and the number two overall pick in the 2012 NFL Draft. Friend of the program, Robert Griffin III. How are you doing, RG3? Rich, I'm doing great, man, and happy to be back on with you. And I know we wanted that run risk run event to get me back in the NFL, but it looks like it ran me all the way to Monday Night Countdown. Well, I'll tell you what, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> it works. It, it's it's uh, everything is working for you, and I couldn't be happier for you, Robert. And you, you know, you're you're terrific at what you do, and it's part of the reason why I have you on here as well. Is your your insight makes me and my colleagues here and my uh, my audience smarter. So uh, let's just jump in with the the news of the Russell Wilson contract and uh what you think uh of that robert griffin the third go for it yeah rich i you know my first thoughts are it's deserved right he deserves to get a new contract 113 wins in his first 10 years most by any quarterback uh in the first 10 years of their career he's a super bowl champ right he's a great ambassador off the field and i think for the broncos they needed a quarterback that gave them instant credibility and hope and i think you get all of those things with Russell Wilson. Uh, my only negative takeaway from the contract is that it wasn't fully guaranteed. And uh, after Deshaun Watson got the $230 million fully guaranteed with everything that he had going on off the field, um, I felt like the guys at the top, the Aaron Rodgers, the Russell Wilsons, they should have uh, pushed to get those deals fully guaranteed so that guys after them don't have to fight that same battle that, that players have been fighting for 10, 20 years trying to get fully guaranteed contracts. So you think they have left um, not just money on the table, but uh, colleagues uh, on the contractual battlefield? Is that what you're saying, Robert? Yes, because everyone's pointing to Lamar Jackson, right? You see the Russell Wilson deal, and you're like, all right, well, he took less guaranteed money than Kyler Murray did. Uh, he definitely took less money guaranteed than Deshaun Watson got. So what? Are, how does that put Lamar Jackson um, in a boat all by himself fighting for a fully guaranteed deal? Uh, the way I look at it, Russell probably wanted to have a few years there where he can come back to the negotiating table. That's also a part of this. Um, but I don't think it has that much of an impact on Lamar Jackson per se because Lamar's in a field of his own, right? Unanimous MVP, only other unanimous MVP is Tom Brady. Um, he's a trailblazer. He plays the game different, sees the game different. I hope he gets that fully guaranteed deal that he's seeking. Um, but for all the guys outside of Lamar that are going to be coming up with these new contracts, the Burroughs, the Herberts, uh, those guys are now spending for themselves, hoping that Lamar gets a deal before the season starts so that they're not going into negotiations next year knowing that they're not going to get a fully guaranteed deal. Well, I guess, you know, uh, the, the question is, is why, you know, Brady left money on the table year in and year out, right? That 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 the cap uh, was always on his mind to make sure that he got uh, uh, a, a championship team giving hometown discounts to the, to the Patriots year after year after year. So, I mean... It, I guess Russ isn't the first one to leave money on the table to the detriment technically to others at the position negotiating. And so I, I guess why shouldn't Russ just look out for number three is what I'm pushing back on on that conversation, Robert. Yeah, Rich, I would put it this way. If Russ was only looking out for number three, then he would have taken a fully guaranteed deal. Brady left money on the table for years and years and years, but there's a couple factors in that as well. Brady had already been paid, right? He already got his big, massive deal. So he knew at that point, listen, uh, you, know, you know, $30 million is a lot of money, guys. Like, but he's saying that $30 million can go towards other players because I've already made my money as a player. So I want to have championship teams because I'm chasing rings. These younger players, like a Lamar Jackson, like a Joe Burrow, like a Justin Herbert, they haven't been paid yet, right? They haven't been paid that big, massive lump sum salary so they're all looking to take care of themselves and the future generations and their family after them. Russell's not in that situation. So I can understand why he would take less money or not go for a fully guaranteed deal 
because he is getting forty nine million a year, right? Like he's getting a lot of money, but he didn't go for the fully guaranteed deal. Maybe because he was trying to help the rest of the roster. Maybe because he was trying to come back to the negotiating table after three years when the guaranteed money is up. Um, but the bottom line is Russell's already had a massive contract before. Uh, he's not hurting for any money. And both Russell Wilson and Tom Brady are married to very rich women. Giselle makes more money than Tom Brady does. And Sierra, I don't know if she makes more than Russell, but she makes a lot of money. So that also plays. <laughs> Robert Griffin III just laying it all out there for everybody right here on the Rich Eisen Show. What do you think is going through Trey Lance's mind right now, RG3? Well, I'm hoping Trey Lance is just focusing on what he can control <laughs> because in this situation, I feel like the 49ers did what was best for them, right? Having a guy that led you to the Super Bowl, I know everyone says he didn't lead them there. He was just on the team, but he was the quarterback, guys. He led them to the Super Bowl, and now having him as your backup, that's great insurance, right? That makes the coaches feel confident, makes the players in the locker room feel confident. If anything happens to Trey Lance, you got a guy that's already been there, done that, didn't win the Super Bowl, but got you there. That gives him a sense of confidence. For Jimmy Garoppolo, he did the best thing for himself. Right? He, there were no starting spots out there, or at least no teams wanted him to be their starter. And if he had gotten cut, uh, my understanding is that he wouldn't have made any money. So he's making more money by getting a restructure, and he's getting more money than he would have gotten on the open market as a backup with incentives to play. So for Jimmy G, it makes complete sense. But obviously, I, I think this wasn't the best thing for, for Trey Lance. You know, the best thing for him would be for Jimmy to be off the team because the media is undoubtedly going to talk about uh, Trey Lance and Jimmy Garoppolo if he started struggling. But if Jimmy wasn't there, it would just be like maybe they should have kept him. Now Jimmy's there. So if he struggles at any point throughout the season, the media narrative is going to be that they need to play Jimmy Garoppolo. And I don't think that's fair to Trey Lance, but as we all know, Life isn't fair, but this isn't an ideal situation for Trey Lance going into his first year as a starter. Well, as you know, um, the management and the coaching staff of the 49ers would be, well, we, we could just keep all the noise out. We'll just create the vacuum here, and and as long as Trey understands we have a very high threshold for whatever struggles he might put on the field, then we'll all be fine. So I ask you, RG3, how realistic is that? in the 21st century you walk me through your experiences on trying to block out a lot of noise that no doubt was surrounding you in your playing days robert yeah i mean i think as a coach or a gm it's, it's your job to, to say those things because you're just trying to let your quarterback know that you got his back you're trying to let your locker room know like this is the way we're doing things but in our 24 7 or 27 7 news hour cycle it, it, that's not going to work, right? Because the team is constantly going to be hearing these things from the from the media. Uh, the players that are going to be constantly hearing these things from the media, the coaches are going to be as well. I mean, I had a coach when I was in in the league that had a big old stack of papers on his de on his desk every single day that was every article written about the team or the coaches. So these coaches pay attention to this stuff, and it affects their decision making. Um, you know, I got a you know I got a lot of respect for for uh, for John Lynch, and I know he's. He's, uh, he's, he's had a lot of success throughout his career, but this is a situation that it was best for the team because you want that backup, but it wasn't the best thing for your starting quarterback. And he, whether they admit that or not, at the end of the day, they have they got two starters on the roster, um, and they're going to have to deal with a lot of heat if they struggle. Is I that... don't think Trey Lance will have catastrophic struggles, but he's going to have a game or two where it's just not the prettiest thing in the world because he's going through some growing pains. I hope that doesn't turn into a media firestorm to get Jimmy Garoppolo back in there. Wait a minute. There was a coach who had like a clip service and there was clips on his desk, like newspaper clippings and stuff like that? 100%. Every, every internet article, online. Rich, if you said something, I promise you it was on there. <laughs> wow. Well, you also know the Shanahan's too, don't you? Um, and, and the offense and maybe their philosophy. I imagine Dad has instilled it in the son who – was obviously not an HC when you were around them. Um, how how is this going to work for Lance? Do you think he's set up with everything to to avoid the struggles that might open the door to all this craziness that we're talking about right now? Yeah, actually, I've listened to what Kyle Shanahan had to say over the past couple months, and I, and I think he's done the best job he can to let Trey Lance and the team and the media know that this is Trey's team. So. When you look at it that way and you look at the weapons, 
that they have on the offensive side of the ball, I do think Trey Lance is set up to succeed. You know, to me, I think he'll have the biggest jump of all the second-year players. When you have a, a, a guy like George Kittle, who's on a Hall of Fame track, and you got Debo Samuel, probably one of the most versatile offensive weapons in the league, that puts you in a great spot. Then you look at his protection. Yes, they lost some guys up front, but his left tackle is Trent Williams. And I, he was my teammate in Washington, and that guy, he called himself a silverback. Yeah. He's the kind of guy you want going to the club with you because he's going to protect you at all costs. <laughs> he is a dominant football player. And I just look at what they did last year, leading the league uh, in yards per, per play with Jimmy Garoppolo making the right decisions. Now you bring in Trey Lance, and he's going to give you a couple 20, 30-yard runs per game that's going to blow up your offense even more, and he's got the arm strength to stretch the field. So I do see that there will be some games or some moments where he struggles, but I think he is set up offensively and defensively. they got a top-five defense. They might have the best defense in the league. Uh, so I think that's a great situation to, to jump into when you're a starting quarterback. Uh, the roster that he has around him is ten times better than any roster I ever had in my career when I was playing the quarterback position. So I don't feel sorry for him there, but he is young. He hasn't played in a really long time or significant snaps in a really long time. So this is going to be a true first experience for him. He's basically a rookie. RG3 here on the Rich Eisen Show. Who's your sleeper team of 2022? Who are you overlooking? Sleeper team that people are overlooking? I'd have to go with the Miami Dolphins. Right with the Eagles coming in a close second, I just don't think people are overlooking the Eagles anymore after they made, made all the trades that they did this off season and brought in the guys they did. But I look at Tua Tungavailoa and I say this is his opportunity with Tyreek Hill, Cedric Wilson. You got Jalen Wild, Raheem Mostert, Chase Edmonds. I mean, they've done an incredible job. Mike McDaniel down there bringing in talent to allow Tua to put his best foot forward. And if he doesn't, they'll go get a guy next year in the draft whether it's C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, or a litany of other quarterbacks uh, that'll be coming out uh, next year. Uh, but I look at the Dolphins, and I just say, man, the Patriots right now, everybody thinks they're vulnerable. You got the Bills in that division. But the Dolphins almost made the playoffs last year without all of these guys on their roster right now. So it's just a matter of their chemistry throughout the year. But that would be my sleeper pick. And uh, I think Philly's going to gonna surprise some people as well. I think now the momentum is more so, more so shifting to them as being a Super Bowl contender. Mm. Uh, but earlier in the offseason, it wasn't that way, and I was already singing their praises. And I think Jalen Hurts, is a, he's a natural-born leader. He's a guy that overcomes everything that's ever put in front of him. I think he's going to show, showcase how much he's grown this year. And then which team are you concerned about entering 2022? Which one do you think? Oh, man. The team I'm concerned about? Yeah. Wow. Let's uh, – I'm going I'm to say two teams, and I'll make it Go quick. For it. No, I'm, no, I'm no. Go for about it. Washington. I'm yeah. concerned about Washington because yeah. uh, earlier in the offseason, I thought that they would be a contender, but it was contingent on their defense, not Carson Wentz. If Carson Wentz plays like he did last year, Washington will be in the playoff hunt. Uh, but their defense, they really struggle on third down. You know, I, I said this on national TV that if in the preseason and last year, uh, if third down was the money down, then Washington would be broke. They cannot get off the field for whatever reason. Uh, they got four first-rounders on their defensive line, and for some odd reason they can't get teams off the field. Last year they were 32nd in the league on third down. So if they don't fix that, that concerns me a little bit in the NFC East. And then with the Bucks, it's not about Brady. You never doubt Brady. This guy is really unbelievable. Uh, but I, I'm just a little concerned about their offensive line. All the injuries, all the, the guys that have left, Brady left in the middle of the, of the training camp and then decided to come back. Like, he's got a lot of, as he said, he's got a lot of ish going on in his life. He's 45. So that concerns me a little bit, but I'm not willing to truly pick against the Bucks. But what's going on in Washington is really concerning. What about Dallas? What about the Cowboys, Robert? Concerned, or you think they, they, they've got the, the division uh, in their sights again and should be the favorites there? What about them? Um, I don't think Dallas wins their division. I think Philly wins that division. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about concerns for Dallas, obviously the receiver room is a, is a massive concern because they just don't have a lot of production there. Right, you got C.D. Lamb who's going to be a number one. I think he will be a true number one. But behind him, uh, they've got a bunch of injuries. So, you know, hey, if you're a Cowboy fan, you got Kevontae Turpin, right? The USFL MVP coming in, returning kicks and punts. But they're really going to have to lean on that running game. And maybe the injuries at receiver will actually make them pick the identity that they, they need to pick. 
which is run the ball through Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard. I think that's their recipe for success, not having Dak go out there and throw the ball 40 times a game. Before I let you go, Robert Griffin III, I'm going to ask you, college and, and pro, uh, your, your, your pick to win it all in both. Um, college and professional football this year, Robert Griffin III, I give you the floor. Who do you got for me? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'll start with the NFL since that's what we're talking about. Yep. My pick to win the Super Bowl is the Baltimore Ravens. Oh. Um I believe they are on a revenge tour. Not just Lamar Jackson, right? He wants to remind everybody, just in case they forgot, that he's the most dynamic offensive weapon in the league. Right? That's running, throwing, whatever you want. He's gonna remind the guys of that. But their defense also struggled last year. They were thirty second in the league against the pass. And I think that's going to have them have a chip on their shoulder. They're healthy now. Uh, they missed the playoffs last year after 26 guys went on IR. I think they're going to come out with a vengeance and actually get it done in the playoffs this year. So that's my pick for the NFL. And then college-wise, I'm going to go with Alabama. And a lot of people are picking Ohio State. Um, you know, I'm in Michigan right now, Rich, mm. uh, just so you know. But I, I'm going to go with Alabama because of Bryce Young and the fact that they used the portal probably better than anyone else in the country. They went and got Jameer Gibbs from Georgia Tech, who's a dynamic running back, running and catching the ball in the backfield. They went and got uh, Jermaine Burton from Georgia, who beat them uh, in the national championship as a big-time down-the-field receiver. And they got Tyler Harrell, who not many people are talking about, but he's a receiver from Louisville, who averaged 29.3 yards per catch last year. Put it this way, he had 23 catches, I believe, and 593 yards. Talk about a deep threat. I think they've added weapons, and their defense is going to be better this year. So that's my will be my pick for Alabama. But, Rich, talking about uh, – I'm at your alma mater right now, man. Oh. I'm in Ann Arbor just oh. strolling around campus trying to figure out what to do. you got to tell me where to go, man. Well, there's many different places for you to go. Um, you know, gosh. Um, uh, you know, if you're into the deli, the Z- Zingerman's Deli is one of the greatest delis in the United States of America. That's number one. Uh, there's the brown jug that used to be good when I was there. I'm, I imagine it's still very good right there as well. Um, those are two good spots, lunch, dinner. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, what, I, I, I mean, if you're into some other stuff, uh, you know, late night drinking, I don't think you are, Robert. <laughs> you're a dad. You're, you're a husband and a father. You got, you're, you're a corporate man at the Worldwide Leader in Sports, but it's a great spot. That's, oh, God, Ann Arbor's beautiful. What are you doing there? You, you're, yeah, uh, man, I'm, I'm out here. Going to see Jim? Uh, this is my first time going to see coming Jim? to the big house. We're calling the game here with oh. Mark Jones. You, oh, you're doing the Colorado State-Michigan game, too? Yeah. Okay. okay. Colorado State well, Michigan now you've game. got to stay two more minutes. Tell me what's going on with the quarterback deal. I didn't even know you were calling that game. Okay. Yeah. All right. right. What, what's going I, I, on I, there? I, I was like, man, I know you're excited about this one, but this is my first time being at the big house, so I, I'm, I'm oh, pretty yeah. sure I'm trying to soak up everything, including the tailgating, but – Listen, for all the Michigan fans out there, okay. this this is a Jim Jim Harbaugh. He's taken a, a page out of Lloyd Carr's book. All right, go back to 1999. Look at what Lloyd Carr did with Tom Brady and, and uh, Drew Mr. Henson. Henson. Yeah. He, this is exactly the same thing. You have a guy who is a team leader. The players love him. He was voted a captain in Cade McNamara. He does everything at the quarterback position better than J.J. McCarthy, except for being a playmaker. That sounds eerily similar to 1999 to me. Um, I think that this is a modern age quarterback battle where you're trying to get a guy not to go in the transfer portal, so you're giving them both opportunities to, to make plays for you. And it worked last year. They played them both. They went to the college football playoff. So Harbaugh is, is trying to string this out as long as he possibly can until one guy takes it. So we'll see. Cade starting tomorrow against – I mean, starting on Saturday against uh, Colorado State. We'll see if he can go out and put up some great numbers that – that, that Trump, whatever McCarthy does uh, in the next game against Hawaii. But that that is what I believe is going on right now. It's just trying to keep a guy from going in the portal. Okay. So then he, that's, that's, that's what I thought, too. I mean, McCarthy is he, – he can run it better than, than Cade, that's for sure. And he's a, more of a double threat. Um, I, you know, and I, I, I just hope that McCarthy has more, you know, um, of an upside than Drew Henson showed when he was at Michigan – and I hope uh, Cade McNamara does go to the NFL and become the greatest player of all time. That would be great if the, if that's the way this all plays out for, for Michigan. Exactly. No one, no one thought that Tom Brady would be the greatest of all time when he left Michigan. Mm. But 
if you go back and like look at what he did at Michigan with hindsight being 2020, the markings were all there. Tom Brady had that in him, that comeback ability, that never, never quit attitude. But I think once again, Harbaugh understands the recruiting probably better than anyone. He's had a lot of top classes recruiting at Michigan. He doesn't want to lose one of these guys that he values so much. Well, I've been on campus in six years, so I'm sure somebody else would, you know, might give you a better sense. Schefter's, you know, uh, been on campus more recently, so maybe he'll give you a better sense of where to go. But um, have a great time. That big house is something else, man. And I, you know, just know you will have my emotions in your hands. Uh, if that game is close, so be careful is all I'm saying <laughs> on Saturday. I look forward to hearing you. This is great. I'm excited for you and me. I oh, appreciate you. Thank you, Rich, man. Appreciate you having me on, brother, let's, as always. Let's God do it bless. again soon. Right back at you. Robert Griffin III, a lot going on. Monday Night Countdown, and he's calling a game in a big house. Amazing.